Okay, good morning. So let's continue where we left off. So we had discussed, let me go back one slide just to the one about thalidomide. <clears throat> this is the, the drug that um, initiated this whole process of studying, analyzing the effects of different versions of the same drug, meaning enantiomers. In some cases, there are actually diastereomers of a drug that can also cause problems. So drugs that any substance that is going to be marketed and ingested by a human being needs to be analyzed for any ill effects of either of its possible stereoisomers. And that process is called resolution. So if the drugs are diastereomers to begin with, then they're easily separated because diastereomers have different properties. In most cases, the majority of cases, we're talking about enantiomers. And regardless of what is the relationship between the drugs, if they coexist in a mixture, they need to be separated from one another. And that process of separating stereoisomers, particularly enantiomers, is called resolution. Because these substances are so close to each other in terms of their properties, it is exceedingly difficult to separate them. And it can be very expensive. There's technologies that have been developed. They have to have been developed because again, we need to separate these compounds in order to be able to isolate them. <clears throat> so there are different ways to execute a resolution process. The, one of the more efficient ones is to reversibly convert them to a mixture of diastereomers. And because as we've said, diastereomers are going to exhibit different physical and chemical properties, then diastereomers can be more easily separated based on these differences. Once you isolate the diastereomers from each other by virtue of separating them due to their differences in physical and chemical properties, again, the key here is a reversible conversion of the um, and antimers into diastereomers. Reversible means that you can then go back and remove whatever agent you added to convert them to diastereomers, return your counts to what they originally were as a pair of enantiomers, but this is accomplished after the separation has taken place. So therefore you can actually manage to isolate them. So this um, little scheme over here gives you this uh, sort of a summary of how this is done. So let's just, let's just imagine you've created a drug mixture. You have an inseparable mixture of enantiomers. Their properties are so close that it is impossible to separate them on their own. And, you know, drug, the, the, let's say the dextrorotatory dextro drug is the one that's going to cure Alzheimer's disease. But it turns out that the levorotatory version of that drug causes cancer. Right? So you can't give to the people you know, the one that's going to cure their Alzheimer's if the other half is going to cause cancer. So you have to separate them, right? So <clears throat> what you do then is that you mix the mixture with what we call a chiral reagent, a pure enantiomer of another substance, only the dextro or only the levo, rotatory, of that second substance, such that when it mixes with the mixture, you're going to have a the, the, the dextro A associating with the dextro B, but you're also going to have the levo A associating with the same dextro B. What that produces is then a mixture of plus plus AB and minus plus AB. When that happens, now you have a mixture of diastereomers because you have two components. Notice they differ in one, but not both. So therefore, they're going to be diastereomers. And once you've created diastereomers, they can be separated much more easily because they have differences in chemical and physical properties. So now that you've separated your compounds, let's say, again, the one you want to isolate is the plus, because that's the one that's going to cure the disease. You also manage to separate, and over here somewhere is going to be your alternative mixture. This one you can discard because it contains the deadly version of the drug. Now you've managed to separate them into a, a substance, a mixture that contains the desired one combined with something else. But because the joining 
is reversible, you now technically split it, take off the part that caused it to become a diastereomer, a mixture of diastereomers, and now you can actually recycle it and reuse it, and this cycle can happen again, and thereby you've managed to separate the single desired enantiomer from the other one. So temporary conversion of the racemic mixture, meaning temporary conversion of the mixture, 50-50 mixture of enantiomers into a mixture of diastereomers allows you to separate them. So is the joining more like ions? It can be non-covalent, yes. It can be a non-covalent association. In some cases, it can be a covalent bond that's established between the two, but that the bond can be easily formed and then easily broken again. So there's different approaches. Absolutely, it can be an ionic association. It can be a you know other types of non-covalent types of associations, but it's not uncommon to do it in terms of what we call diastereomeric salts, which are ionic compounds. Those are separated, and then you manage to isolate your compound from the reagent. As I said, the second alternative would, would be a covalent bond, something that can be put on, separate, and then you chop it off, and then you recover your compound. Now, there's a second alternative, which is uh, has been gaining more uh, applications over the past several decades, which is using chromatography. So you learned about thin layer chromatography in the lab. There is an alternative type of chromatography, which is called column chromatography, in which the same type of material that you used in those plastic plates, that white little powder, which we, we called silica gel, it's a type of very finely ground glass type of a substance. So it turns out that you can use larger scale uh, separation methods using these kinds of substances in which you can actually buy jugs of this white powder and you can put it into a glass column. Here they're showing it as a little cartoon, but imagine taking like very finely ground, like powdered sugar type of thing, and you, and you pack a thin glass column with that substance. You can actually then add your mixture into the top of the column, through the top, and at the same time add a solvent that's going to then allow for the substances to move down and you're going to have a little container down here that's going to drip, 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 pick up what's flowing through the column. Normally, if we're dealing with different substances, as you learned in the laboratory, different substances as they interact with silica gel on the TLC plate, they have different affinities for the mobile phase versus the stationary phase and they move at different rates and you can manage to separate them and identify them and whatever. Here is the same concept. The substances in this, in, in case, instead of going vertically up by capillary action, they're actually going downward by um, gravity. So the substances will start flowing down the column. Some of them will ad adsorb or adhere, if you will, to the powder more strongly. Those stay behind. Others will dissolve more readily in the solvent. Those move along faster, and that's how you ultimately manage to separate them. If you have a mixture of enantiomers, they're going to be pretty much behaving exactly the same way in this type of scenario. So this will not allow for separation of enantiomers. However, if you, to the silica gel, attach something that is it's self chiral, Let me clean this up for a minute, a piece of something chiral, and let me zoom in so that you can see what I'm talking about, all right? So here is that, that um, here is the little bead of the, the little particle of the, of the white powder to which you have attached something covalently. And if you notice, this orality center, because it has one, two, three, and then of course the bead, the whole thing, will be number four. So this is a chiral reagent, if you will. So imagine this as a little glove, as a little mitten in there that has a particular shape that only fits or fits much better you, the right hand versus the left hand, right? So again, this is very cartoonish, but just imagine that you add a mixture of right hands and left hands 
from dolls, right? Little, little hands and you add them left and right, left and right, all mixed. Well, only the ones that fit into the glove are going to interact strongly with the little glove. The ones that don't are gonna continue down the column. So by packing the column with a chemically modified silica gel that has attached to it something that is asymmetric, that's what I'm circling in the middle, it then allows your substance, your substance, which is also asymmetric, to interact differently with that piece that is also asymmetric. So of the pair of enantiomers, they've now encountered something that's itself asymmetric. They will interact differently with it. One will spend more time interacting with the silica gel that's now been altered. The one that is not the better fit is going to continue moving down the column. And then what turns out to happen is that you can actually manage to separate the two compounds. So if you have your little container down here that's picking up what's coming out of the column, one compound will come out first, the other enantiomer is going to come out second. As it passes through here, let me change back to red so that you can see it better. As it's passing through here, you have an, an instrument that is shining light on it. Here's the light source, here's the detector that ultimately generates a graph. It all, it's all processed by a computer. And then you can observe first compound came out, second compound came out. You could have more than one compound, right? More than two compounds. But in the case of a mixture of enantiomers, you technically would have only two. And you can manage to detect the time it took for them to come out, and you can manage to separate them based on this interaction with a chiral entity. So this is a critical piece of information because what this then illustrates is a, is a general concept that chiral objects, chiral substances, they behave differently when they are interacting with other chiral substances. And this is the reason why the two carbones that we saw previously, one smells like caraway seeds, the other one smells like spearmint. Well, the reason is you have two asymmetric substances entering into your nostrils, interacting with your olfactory receptors, which are themselves asymmetric. Notice how the two enantiomers will interact differently with the same chiral receptor that produces a different signal. That's why you in, you in, your brain interprets those signals as the smell of caraway versus the smell of spearmint, okay? So these are critically important uh, concepts and where it becomes really relevant, <coughs> excuse me, is again, with pharmaceuticals and toxins and hormones and other substances interacting with your innate biological receptors. So as we've been saying, stereoisomers cause distinct physiological effects because their mode of interaction largely relies on interacting directly with biological molecules. And most of these molecules are also chiral. They are asymmetric. So two versions of a drug or two versions of a toxin, when they enter the body, they will interact with particular receptors. They will do so differently. They will then ultimately have the potential to induce very different responses, which is the discussion that we sort of were talking about last time about thalidomide and the, you know, the different drugs, the penicillamine and so and naproxen, that the different versions of the drug have different effects. In the case of ibuprofen, we mentioned that it didn't matter because one of them just doesn't do anything. <clears throat> that would be the ideal situation. But in many cases, that's not what happens, right? So it turns out if you look inside the human body, many drugs interact with molecules that we're going to learn a little bit later more about in detail, more detail, that are called enzymes. Enzymes are nothing other than very large, very sophisticated biological catalysts. What they do is that they will control how and how fast chemical reactions occur in the human body. They're the controllers of everything that happens in the human body. <clears throat> Turns out that many disease processes are related or associated with enzymes sort of going crazy and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So overactive enzymes. 
and we need to shut them down. In other cases, it's the opposite. For whatever reason, the enzyme shuts down or is not working properly. So we need an, we need an agent to bind to it to sort of activate it, right? But the most common scenario for enzymes is shutting them down. So the <clears throat> alternative would be a biological receptor, which is again a substance. It can either be on the cell membrane it can either be floating within the cytoplasm, it can actually be in the nucleus as well. In some cases, these receptors exist in the cytoplasm and then once they bind something, they migrate to the nucleus and they do things with your genes and turn things on or turn things off. There's all kinds of different types of biological receptors. Again, many drugs, what they do is that they, they are designed to be a perfect or a good fit on the pockets, on surface features of these biological molecules, and that either turns them on or turns them off or modulates their activity <clears throat> such that the desired pharmacological effect is observed. And the issue is that these substances, these drugs that enter the body, if you have, you, if, you, if there are different versions of that drug, only one of those isomers that exist for the drug are going to be the good fit. So here's an example of the surface of an enzyme or a receptor or whatever biological molecule we're trying to target with the drug. You have several, in this case two, let's say they are enantiomers. Um, one of them is the one that makes contact with the receptor in the right spots. Let's say three, three spots on the receptor need to be interacted with and one of the isomers has the asymmetric three-dimensional shape that fits that allows its best interaction with the three spots on the receptor so that introduces a response right well the alternative version of the drug only touches two but it misses the third because it's the mirror image let's say it's the enantiomer it's the mirror image so now the central piece, which in the one on the left is in the right position that fits in that third central spot that's in pink, the second one is pointing in the wrong direction. So this spot gets missed. So this, either, this does an alternative, right? Alternate response. So what can, that res what can that response be? Well, it can be nothing happens. This is what happens with ibuprofen. Or it can be that it kills you. This is what happens with naproxen and with penicillamine. It can also be that it induces a different response. This is what happens with thalidomide. It causes those teratogenic responses that causes, you know, all kinds of malformations and things of the sort. Whereas the one that is the good drug, the good version is the one that resolves the headache and the morning sickness. So it really is a result of chiral substances interacting with other chiral substances and different substances produce different responses because of the asymmetry that they all have and therefore their interactions will be different okay all right so that's pretty much all that we wanted to discuss about stereochemistry so we now are officially beginning chapter 10 in in your textbook so all of this discussion that we've had regarding uh, stereochemical concepts are contained in that packet. It was, I think it was about 14 pages that is posted on Blackboard. And of course you have the slides uh, in this same slide packet. Now we are moving on to chapter 10 from the Raymond textbook. So I've already alluded to some of these things. And in fact, some of the concepts that are gonna come up in this discussion. We've already talked about when we were uh, talking about stereochemistry, we introduced them. We're gonna expand on them and recap and review them as we go through this initial discussion. So if you recall, the formula of glucose is C6H12O6. And if you analyze, that can actually be written as C6H2O6. So this is where the, the name carbohydrate came from, carbo referring to carbon, hydrate referring to water. So hydrate of carbon, suggesting that these compounds contain carbon with water molecules somehow incorporated into the carbon structure. It turns out, now we know that that's not exactly the case, even though the composition or their formula may reflect that, they're actually 
more complex than just carbon associated with water molecules. So that name, however, it's historical, it has persisted, and it's a perfectly acceptable uh, way to describe these compounds. Uh, so carbohydrates are also known as sugars, and uh, these are common, this is common terminology. So in terms of structurally what these compounds are, somebody was asking a question, sorry. Oh, I already answered that question. All right, sorry about that. Um, what structurally these compounds are, they contain either an aldehyde or a ketone with multiple alcohol structures, polyhydroxy means multiple hydroxy groups, i.e. OH groups, which in the context of organic structures is an alcohol, right? So multiple alcohols sort of dispersed throughout a skeleton of a structure whose primary functional group is either an aldehyde or a ketone. Now, if you look in nature, most carbohydrates that exist on planet Earth are produced by plants by a complex, very interesting process known as photosynthesis. Those of you who may be going to take biochemistry, uh, not in this department, but in North Campus, either chemistry or biology, you will learn about the, the biochemical aspects of, of photosynthesis. This is how plants produce carbohydrates from simple building blocks like CO2 and oxygen and water and things of the sort. So if you look in nature, carbohydrates have an enormity of important biological functions. They are integral components of cellular structures, particularly cell membranes, cell walls, if you look at microorganisms, cell membranes in humans and many other organisms as well. Turns out the, the main skeleton of all of your genetic material, RNA and DNA, and of course that of any other organism that carries either RNA or DNA, viruses and other types of uh, microbes, the main structural framework of all of that is actually largely composed of sugars, carbohydrates. We're going to learn about the structures of these compounds uh, a little bit later on. Turns out that carbohydrates are critically important cellular structures as the first line implies, but they are critically important for intercellular cell to cell or interorganism. So a human cell with a microbe cell or different kinds of cells coming from different sources, communication. So carbohydrates actually exist on the surface of many of our cells. Without those carbohydrates, we would not be able to, or, or some of our cells would not be able to communicate with each other. So they serve as antennas or receptors or structures that are part of the make, what, what makes the, the appearance of one cell relative to another and cells can scan. What does the surface of this other entity look like? By scanning and feeling and assessing structures of carbohydrates and other things on the surface of the other cell and that allows them to communicate with each other and then recognizing each other and so on and so forth. Turns out there's another critically important function of carbohydrates, which is cellular energy. So many of our cells will store a reasonable amount of what we call glycogen. We're gonna talk about all these compounds and structures in this chapter. Glycogen is a major depot of glucose, it turns out, in polymeric form, very, very large structures, many, 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 many glucoses bonded to each other covalently. It's a reversible process. They can be added, they can be removed. It's always a, a back and forth of how much glycogen we have in our cells. This actually provides energy in between meals. So when you have your last meal of the day and all of that foods, all of those nutrients come into your body, Many of those carbohydrates that are coming into the diet, much of that, whatever is left after you know the body uses it for energy, the excess is then stored, much of the excess is stored in the form of a glycogen. And then when you're sleeping, when you're in an overnight fast, then the body can start biting into that glycogen and provide 
glucose to all of the other tissues, well, to themselves, first of all, but certain tissues like the liver and the kidney and others will actually provide glycogen in large amounts to, themse- to, to the rest of the body so that then the brain and other vital organs like the heart and other ones can have glucose in between meals. So we're going to talk about these energy depots and how they get constructed and how they get broken down in these vital energy producing processes. And then it turns out carbohydrates, as we're going to learn as well, when we start talking about metabolism, carbohydrates are critically important building blocks for larger and more complex either carbohydrate structures like glycogen, but they also serve as the skeleton, they provide the skeletons to the organic framework for a whole host of other important biological compounds that we're gonna be talking about in this discussion, okay? So again, the learning objectives are here for you to uh, read through as you study. This is kind of an FYI type of thing. We're gonna start talking about simple sugars and we're gonna start building and going towards things that are more complex, okay? So we first need to get through some terminology that is gonna be critically important for you to understand what's, uh, what we're gonna be talking about. You may have already, if you've already had the lab this week, you likely have already learned of some of these terms. So if you have, then this, some, of, some of this may be a little bit of a review. Of course, we're gonna go through it as if you've not seen it before, but just FYI. So saccharides, the term saccharides in general refers to sugars. It's another sort of synonym to sugars. Now, depending on how many basic elements or structural components are contained in that saccharide, we call them either monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, or polysaccharides. So a monosaccharide are the simplest of the structure Uh, the simplest sugars, the one that have the simplest structures, what that truly means, how we distinguish mono from oligo from poly, is how many of those simple sugars are actually bonded to each other. So the ones that are not bonded to anything other than the frame, that, that contain only their own framework, but they're not bonded to other sugars, meaning that if you try to break them down into simpler sugar, uh, sugars, you cannot do that. Those are called monosaccharides. So one way to break down sugars that are larger, more complex into simpler ones is to treat them with dilute acid. Well, if you have a monosaccharide, you're already at the smallest, simplest level you can get. So if you treat them with acid, you're not going to get anything other than what you started with. So if you do not generate simpler sugars by treating them with acid, then what you have is a monosaccharide. So these turn out to be the building blocks for all of the other ones that are larger, more complex, that then will ultimately contain multiple of these monosaccharides. So as we've said, these structures contain aldehydes or ketones with alcohol groups dispersed throughout the skeleton. We classify sugars in different ways. We can classify them based on the aldehyde or ketone that they contain In that regard, we call them either aldoses or ketoses. If the main functional group is an aldehyde, we call it an aldose. If it's a ketone, we call it a ketose. We can also classify sugars based on the number of carbons it is containing in its skeleton. So triose means it has three tetros, it has four pentose, it has five hexose, it has six, and so on and so forth. We've already mentioned hexoses, glucose, galactose, fructose. Those are, the, in fact, the most important sugars that are out there are the hexoses. The second class of most important are the pentoses, ribose, ribulose, and others that we're going to see throughout the discussion. The R in RNA, ribonucleic acid, the ribo means that the skeleton of that, sh- of that structure contains ribose, okay? We're going to see that a little bit later. Now, when up to about 10 or so of these monosaccharides covalently link to each other to form a larger aggregate, 
We call that an oligosaccharide. It depends on what book you read, you know, up to about 10, typically 10 to about a dozen or so. There's no real definition that's absolute, but you have to have a, a reasonable number of these sugars bonded together. At that point, we call it a oligosaccharide. Again, if you treat it with acid, you can hydrolyze these structures and you can completely separate the monosaccharides that had combined into individual monosaccharides, right? So we'll call them oligosaccharides. And the type of bond that joins them together is referred to as an acetal linkage. We saw in the previous discussion on stereochemistry what was a hemiacetal, which is the structure that the, the functional group that forms when a single monosaccharide closes on itself to form a ring structure. Or if you remember the analogy that I made, if, if your hand grabs your foot, right, and you form a ring structure with yourself, in the case of a sugar, one of the alcohols wraps around and forms a bond with the aldehyde or ketone and that latches on and closes the ring, that produce a hemiacetal. Technically, hemi means half, half of an acetal. As we're gonna see in this discussion, when we start looking at pictures, when two, not the same, but two distinct separate monosaccharides bond with each other to form oligosaccharides, the type of bond that forms is what we call an acetal. If you've had the lab and you've looked at the lab manual, this may have been described to you by your lab instructor, that the manual describes a little bit of how the acetals are formed, ultimately broken down to then release the monosaccharides. If you have more than 10-ish, right, very large number, 20, 30, 100, 3,000 sugars, it can be that big, then we're talking about these enormously large aggregates. We call those polysaccharides, okay? And again, they can be hydrolyzed using dilute acid. Part of the experiment that you would have learned in the lab this week was taking starch. Starch is nothing other than a polysaccharide. It's actually one a cellulose, a mixture of cellulose, uh, sorry, a mixture of amylose and amylopectin, two types of structures we're gonna be learning in this chapter, which are starches. They are enormously large, right? And there's a test that you can do to detect the presence of starches. You add a little bit of iodine and it turns a very dark bluish color. The starches can be hydrolyzed to their corresponding monosaccharides that would be complete hydrolysis. That Then if you add iodine at that point, you're not gonna see the blue color because the starch is gone. If you do get a blue color or a bluish color, that means that your starch has not been completely hydrolyzed, and that would be associated with partial hydrolysis. But ultimately, if you wait long enough, or if you heat it, all of your polysaccharide can be completely hydrolyzed, and that would release hundreds or thousands of, of monosaccharides, because these structures are, in fact, can be enormously large. So let's go back to the classification of sugars. So again, based on functional group, if it has an aldehyde or ketone, we call them aldoses or ketoses, okay? If it has three sugars, it's a triose. Four sugars, it's a tetrose, and so on and so forth. As I've mentioned, the most important ones in nature are five and six carbons, so pentoses and hexoses. But there are, in fact, we're going to see one at least in part of our discussion when we talk about metabolism. There are some important seven carbon sugars. We call them heptoses. Not so much anything beyond that, but you can continue theoretically naming them octoses, nonoses, etc. And you can actually combine these uh, designators into one. If you have an aldose that has X number of sugars, you can sort of put those two terms together. So for example, an aldotriose is a sugar that has an aldehyde and it happens to also have three carbons. You can talk about a ketoheptose, for example, that has a ketone as the primary functional group and it happens to have seven sugars. So if you look at the one on the bottom, 
we have an aldehyde and then you have one, two, three, four, five carbons. We can call that an aldopentose. If you look at the one on the right, it has a ketone somewhere along the structure and then it has one, two, three, four carbons. We call this a keto tetros. Notice how it's an aldehyde or ketone with multiple alcohols scattered throughout the structure, okay? All right, so if you're looking at these compounds, how would you classify them based on the types of functionalities that they're carrying? So this first one is a ketose, and then it also happens to have one, two, three. So this is a keto triose, okay? If you look at B, let me change colors to distinguish. This is an aldose that happens to have one, two, three, four carbons. So this is an aldo uh, tetrose. Okay. If we go back to the third one, this is a ketose and it has one, two, three, four, five. So this is, I'm going to write it on the top. This is a keto pentose. And then if we go to the one on the bottom, this is an aldose and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is an aldoheptose. Okay, aldoheptose. All right. So we've already talked about Fisher projections in the previous discussion. This is sort of a, a review. Remember, when you're looking at a Fisher projection, what that truly means is that the horizontal is coming up towards you and the vertical is going behind you. That's always true when you have a single chirality center as what is shown here. When you have multiple chirality centers, it turns out that the one that's truly going behind you is the first one and the last one. Technically, all the ones in the middle are, in theory, in the plane of the paper, right? Because that's after you flattened it, if you recall what we talked about last time or a lecture or two ago. I don't remember if it was last time or the previous one. So very, very useful when you have multiple chirality centers. So here, for example, you have all of these are aldoses, right? Because they have an aldehyde on them. The first one is an aldotetros, the second one is an aldopentose, the last one is an aldo um, hexose, right? So two, three, or four chirality centers, very easy, much cleaner to look at when you're drawing them as a uh, Fisher projection than starting to look at multiple wedges and dashes going all over the place. There's a couple of problems in the homework that actually do reflect some of these structures with multiple wedges and dashes, and then you'll move to other problems that have cleaner Fisher projections, and I hope you will appreciate how much easier to, to the eye, right, when you're looking at it. It's much cleaner, uh, much more refined to look at it in, in the form of a Fisher projection, easier to decipher what's, what's, what's happening, right? So again, we've already talked about these concepts of chirality. Glyceraldehyde is the simplest of the sugars. You can draw it as a pair of enantiomers in front of a mirror using wedges and dashes, but again, it's much easier, much cleaner to reflect these structures uh, in the form of Fisher projections, and it much becomes much more easier to, uh, much more easy to, uh, you know, distinguish between one and the other. And then, as we've established, you look at the aldehyde, the hydroxy on the furthest most chirality center. In this case, there's only one. On the right, this is what makes it a D sugar as seen by the name of this structure. If it happens to be on the left, right, this is what makes it an L sugar. So this is D glyceraldehyde versus L glyceraldehyde, okay? So when you're looking at sugars that are larger, more complex, again, in the case of glucose and all of its possibilities, there are four chirality centers, one, let me do it in red so that it becomes more visible, right? One, two, three, four chirality centers. We've already been through this in the previous discussion. So technically 16 possible stereoisomers. Again, this is the D version because this is to the right. 
This is the L version because this is to the left. And glucose is shown here in the form of D-glucose. Notice how the enantiomer, everything is flipped as we've discussed. What is right on one side is to the left on the other and vice versa. Everything is completely flipped. So that's why the one right there is L-glucose. If you compare that to the one on the far right, which is D-galactose, so this is D, right? And then we've already established that it differs from glucose on carbon-4 and carbon-4 only, and this is why they're called epimers. So this, this should be a review for everyone, right? All right, so there's a way to actually remember glucose, and I'm going to attempt to show you how to do this. So if you take your right hand, your right hand, and you sort of put it on top of the glucose structure, and the four chirality centers are your four fingers, and what I want everybody to do is to fold your fingers in the direction of the hydroxy groups, okay? So put your, your four fingers on top of the four chirality centers and fold your fingers in the direction of the four hydroxy groups that are on those chirality centers. And you're going to notice something that you will hopefully forever remember. I learned this when I was in college back in the 19, late 80s and early 90s, probably before most of you were born. And never will I forget how the structure of glucose is in the Fisher projection because you can clearly read it from your fingers and it gives you a very particular orientation of your fingers, right? So I'll let people figure that one out and then I'm going to move on in the discussion, okay? All right. And if you do your left hand on top of L-glucose, you're going to get the mirror image and if you do both of your hands, one in front of each other with your fingers in the directions, you're going to notice something else. I'll leave it at that. That's why it's good that my video is off right now because I don't want to be recorded projecting something that I shouldn't. Those of you who got it are going to get what I'm talking about. All right. So again, this is review. D-glucose and L-glucose are enantiomers. D-galactose is a diastereomer of both D-glucose and L-glucose. We've already talked about this. Remember, we can say that D and L glucose, uh, D and D glucose and D galactose, sorry, these two, they're also called epimers because they differ in one and only one stereocenter. When you compare L glucose with D galactose, they differ in three out of the four, so at least one, but not all. So the only thing that you can say about those two is that they are diastereomers, okay? Those are diastereomers. All right, so this is a little joke that we found on the internet because you can find anything on the internet, right? So again, if you look at Samuel L. Jackson on the left and you look at Samuel D. Jackson on the right, we hope this goes chiral. Sorry, it's kind of a lame joke, but we, we found it funny when we found this on the internet. All right. So now we're going to, all up to this point, it should have been review, right? So now we're going to introduce some additional new terminology that relates to carbohydrates and their structural features. We sort of alluded a little bit to this in the stereochemistry discussion, but now we're going to expand on it in much more detail. So again, as I mentioned, the most abundant monosaccharides in nature are five and six carbons. And it turns out that nature decided, for whatever reason, that they were gonna stick with the D sugars as the ones that they're gonna work with, right? Now, as I previously said, it doesn't mean that L sugars do not exist in nature. There are some, a handful, few of them, L sugars that nature makes in particular places for particular reasons, because it needs them in a particular situation. But if you look, stand back and look what's out there, the vast majority of the sugars that are ever utilized in any type of biological process are D sugars, okay? And the most abundant are five and six carbons. So if you look at the first two on the left, 
these are two critically important five carbon sugars. I already mentioned a few moments ago, ribose. That's the one that's shown there. And then the one that's next to ribose over here, we call it 2-deoxyribose because if you observe, the hydroxy group on carbon number two is gone. So deoxy means it does not have an oxygen. It's been deoxygenated, right? And it's on position number two. That's why it's called 2-deoxy. So this is in fact the sugar that then will form the framework or skeleton of your DNA. DNA, the D stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So deoxyribo is the D, nucleic is the N, acid is the A, DNA. So the framework of DNA is made up of that deoxyribose, deoxy on carbon number two it turns out, Whereas, as I mentioned earlier, your RNA is made up of ribose, among many other things, but the, the, the main framework is ribose. Now, if you then look at the dietary sugars, the ones that we take in in the diet that provide energy, structural features, and many other things that we said, skeletons of other things, et cetera, those are the ones that are shown towards the right with glucose, in the center because it turns out glucose is the most important of all the sugars that we ingest and that we utilize in the body. It provides, it is the primary provider of energy for all of your cells under normal circumstances. We're gonna learn a little bit later that in certain situations, for example, if you are under starvation situations or if you're following one of these uh, keto diets in which you're not ingesting practically any carbohydrates, then the body will shift its utilization of these molecules to use other types of structures for energy. Um, and then glucose just becomes, does not become the primary source. But under normal circumstances where everybody is ingesting a balanced diet that contains carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and et cetera, then glucose is in fact the most important nut uh, nutrient in terms of energy. Galactose is an important sugar that comes from dairy products. Um, lactose contains, it's a disaccharide, two sugars, glucose and galactose bonded to one another. You might've learned about that in the lab as well if you've already taken it. And then fructose is another very important uh, nutrient coming from the diet. Sucrose, which is regular table sugar, is actually also a disaccharide that contains glucose and fructose. So any sugar, natural sugar, that you ingest from fruits and foodstuffs in general, uh, if it contains sugar, what we call table sugar, sucrose, that actually gets hydrolyzed in, in the intestines to a glucose and a fructose. So those are very important. So if we look at the bottom of the slide, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so that we can see it a little bit better. So you, I will tell you which ones you need to know. You do not need to remember, somebody's asking if we need to know the structures of these carbohydrates. The ones that you will have to remember are glucose for sure, both in open chain and cyclic form as we're gonna be discussing. And then galactose, you need to know as well because you're gonna to have to be able to distinguish between glucose and galactose. And then fructose, again, these three that are on the right, those are the ones that you absolutely need, are gonna to need to know because we're gonna be talking about them again and again and again and again, okay? All right, so if we pay attention to the bottom, if we pay attention to the bottom of the slide, let me bring this up just a smidgen so that you can see that a little bit better. So remember what we talked about, let me clean this up because it's already messy. Um, what we talked about previously, that if you take this structure and you turn it around sideways, 90 degrees. Imagine you're turning it 90 degrees sideways. And then you bend it sort of back towards away from you, picking up the hydroxy of the carbon that's furthest from the aldehyde and pick up the aldehyde and fold the structure backwards sort of toward itself. And then you're gonna do a little rotation as we discussed you're gonna to get to this type of structure right here, right? So if you notice, any, we talked about this already, anything that's to the right, as you turn it sideways 90 degrees, is gonna be pointing downward, right? 
Now, the last one, which is this one, which is carbon number four, after you do the little rotation, the hydroxy would have been pointing downward if you rotate to the left a certain number of degrees. That will then bring the hydroxy group in its closest proximity to the aldehyde. We talked about this in the previous discussion. We did it with glucose. We're now doing it with ribose. That causes this to sort of go upward, and it brings the hydroxy in its closest proximity to the aldehyde. Now, we also discussed that the aldehyde, depending on this bond here, can be pointing downward or can be pointing upward. And then when it's upward and the hydroxy closes here, it brings this up, which will be cis to this. But if it closes as it is on the left, in which this carbonyl of the aldehyde is pointing down relative to this one, then you end up with the alternative, which is this trans arrangement, okay? So let me erase this mess for a moment so that I can recap with a cleaner slate over here. If this hydroxy bonds to the aldehyde with this pointing downward, you're going to end up with this pointing downward and this pointing upward in a trans arrangement, okay? If it happens with this pointing upward and this forms the bond here, then you're going to end up with this and this in the same direction, which we call it a cis isomer. It turns out that this is a dynamic process. So the structure will close on itself either like this or like that, if it closes on the one that's on the middle left, it forms the trans. If it closes like the one on the middle right, it forms the cis. But the cis will open, form the open form. The aldehyde will rotate. It will close and then form the trans. It's a constant back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So in solution, in your bodily fluids, these sugars will exist, in fact, as a mixture of this structure in which these two are trans, this open form, that open form in which the only difference is the rotation around the aldehyde, and it will also exist, a certain percentage, right, will exist as the one that's on the far right. So as we said, when you're looking at these open chain structures, this OH on the furthest most chirality center from the aldehyde or ketone, in this case it's aldehyde. If it's pointing to the right, that means this is a D sugar. That hydroxy is this hydroxy. So what that then mandates is that how we define a D sugar in the ring form is you find this structure, which is the hemiacetal, remember hemiacetal, ether simultaneously bonded to an O an alcohol or an OH. If you're going around the ring, the furthest most chirality center, which is this chirality center, if the CH2OH on the ring is pointing upward, that's what defines a D sugar. Okay? Now, once you've established it's a D sugar, if this OH that is on the hemiacetal is pointing downward when this is pointing upward, meaning these are in a trans arrangement, we call that the alpha orientation, alpha. It's actually alpha configuration is the name, is the proper term. If alternatively, when it closes, this is our hemiacetal if that OH ends up pointing upward because this was trapped when it was pointing upward and these two end up in a cis arrangement. That's called the beta configuration. And the relationship between these two structures are said that they are anomers. Okay, they are anomers. They differ exclusively on the relative orientation of the hydroxy group on the hemiacetal carbon 
which only exist in ring structures. There's no such concept in the open chain. When the OH is pointing upward relative to the H2OH, we call that the beta orientation. When the OH is pointing in the opposite direction of the CH2OH, we call that the alpha anomer. When the ring opens, they disappear. There's no such concept of anomers. When the ring closes, it can close with those either going one way or the other. Again, alpha means that these two are in the opposite direction. Beta means that they're in the same direction. Okay. All right. So let me just give you a quick review. We've already talked about formation of hemiacetals. Let me zoom out of this thing. So this is sort of drawn a little bit differently than we had seen in the previous slides, but it's the same concept. So hemiacetals is what forms when a structure closes on itself and forms a ring, okay? So again, if you focus on the bottom, let me change back to red because it's more visible. So here you have an aldehyde and here you have an alcohol. The alcohol is somewhere in a distant portion along the skeleton. This one's technically not a sugar, it's just a random compound that happens to have an alcohol and an aldehyde in the same skeleton. But notice the alcohol is you know, several carbons away, so it allows for the structure to wrap around itself, and then this alcohol can form a bond here, and then that's what produces this hemiacetal structure. So a carbon simultaneously bonded to an alcohol, simultaneously bonded to an ether, okay? So hemiacetals result when a carbonyl of an aldehyde or ketone reacts with an alcohol and they react with each other. The alcohol forms a bond with the carbonyl. The double bond ends up picking up that hydrogen. You end up with this structure. Again, how do you recognize a hemiacetal? Any carbon simultaneously bonded to OH, simultaneously bonded to OR. R means some random carbon chain. Now, it turns out, this is new, up to this point is review. What we had not talked about is that if a second, another, number two, alcohol is floating around, further chemistry happens such that the OH of the hemiacetal gets replaced by another ether type linkage. So what ends up happening is that this OR exchanges for this OH, and you now end up with two ether linkages. That's what we call an acetal, okay? As we're gonna learn, this is what actually holds together the sugars of oligo and polysaccharides. They are acetal structures, okay? The reason why this is called a hemiacetal, hemi means half, is because half of the acetal is what exists in that structure. In the full acetal, you have OR and OR, two ether linkages bonded coming from the same carbon. In the hemiacetal, only one of the ethers has formed, the other half is actually an alcohol, okay? So technically, oops, alcohol, right? Technically, it's half of the acetal because only one of the two ORs have ultimately attached to that central carbon. Hemiacetals, cyclic hemiacetals, to be more specific, they're ring structures, is what holds together monosaccharides when they close on themselves. This is what happens with ribose. Here's ribose in the open chain form. Again, this can be up or down. When it closes, it forms this one or that one, right? And notice, here's the hemiacetal of this one. Here's the hemiacetal of the other one, right? And the, they're different in the relative orientations of that hydroxy relative to that CH2OH. This is the alpha structure. This is the beta structure, okay? All right, here there's no, in this example, there's no such concept of alpha or beta because there's no, it's only when you have multiple hydroxies in the structure. But here this is just trying to illustrate the difference between a hemiacetal 
and an acetal. All right, so let's define some additional terminology. Those structures that we just talked about, alpha versus beta, that we refer to as anomers, the only reason why they arise is, again, the manner in which the hydroxy group attacks the aldehyde and how they are oriented one relative to the other. So this difference that comes from the rotation of the aldehyde is what results on this carbon, which is the carbon of the aldehyde, right? It's the same carbon, this one over here. It turns out it's this carbon, right? That carbon we call the anomeric carbon because that is the source of the existence of the anomers when the ring closes in one direction or the other direction. So in the open chain compound, the original aldehyde or ketone carbon, that is what we refer to as the anomeric carbon because in the closed ring structure, it's that carbon that is the source of this structural difference over here. That's what results in the anomers. So notice how it's been labeled. Let me clean this up so you can see it again. Notice how the anomeric carbon is this carbon, which is this carbon. Well, it's also this carbon, right? Because the difference is that this one results in these two being in the same orientation. That's what makes it beta. In this case, these two result in the opposite orientation. That's what makes it alpha. And these are the two anomers, the alpha anomer versus the beta anomer. That is the, in, the result of this versus this and how this traps this. And that's what produces either this compound or that compound. It's because this carbon can be in one orientation or the other. So carbon one or carbon four is where they connect. And that is absolutely correct, okay? And you can, if you follow the, the skeletons carefully, you can see that again, if you rotate, if you rotate this entire structure sideways 90 degrees, and this ends up binding to that, which is what's happening here, it's carbon one and carbon four, as you have wisely pointed out, that's what is forming the two different anomers. And that's, a, that's how the ring closes on itself. That is absolutely correct. All right. So again, as we've discussed, when you rotate the structure sideways 90 degrees and then you wrap it around such that this forms that, because it's a D sugar in this case, that's what this is defining, that's what ultimately results in this being upward in the Hayworth projection. So when you have that last furthest chirality center from the anomeric carbon, which is this one, the one that's furthest, which is that one. With that CH2OH pointing upward, that's what defines a D sugar, okay? In the Hayworth projection. In the open chain, it's defined by being pointing to the right. In the chair, in the, in the ring form, it's pointing upward. That's what defines the D sugar, okay? So you need to stand back and look at all of this together, right? So again, this concept of the open chain forms closing in one direction or another is what forms the alpha versus beta orientations. When these two are pointing in the same direction, that's beta. When they're pointing in opposite directions, it's alpha. But this means that it's a D sugar right? The fact that this is pointing in the opposite direction is what makes it alpha. This phenomenon of alpha opening, the aldehyde rotating, the now rotated aldehyde closing again to form the beta, that whole process, which I said is completely reversible, and it's constantly happening with all of your sugars and your bodily fluids, that process is called muta rotation, muta rotation. If you follow these two structures and you pay very close attention to how are they related structurally, these structures are actually diastereomers, okay? Diastereomers. I'm gonna write it here with my chicken scratch. Diastereomers, beta and alpha anomers 
are diastereomers. Just like epimers are diastereomers, anomers are diastereomers. Because if you realize this is the same, and this is the same, and this is the same. However, this one is different, right? So they differ in one, but not all of the chorality centers. Anomers are diastereomers, okay? So the key here to recap is that when this is up, it's D. When these two, let me change colors, when these two are opposite, that's what makes it alpha. When these two are in the same direction, that's what makes it beta. Okay? All right. So, this is going to come back again and again and again. So, if it's feeling overwhelmed with all this information, it's going to come back again and again and again. But, that being said, it's going to require you to go to your textbook and to those pages that we talked about in the stereochemistry section and take the time to go through those structures, what's pointing up, what's pointing down, what's to the left, what's to the right, because these are going to be important concepts to remember as we go through these discussions. All right. So let's focus on specific sugars that we need to be well-versed in. The question was asked earlier, do we need to know these sugars? Well, yes, I said glucose, galactose, fructose, and we'll point out any others that are critically relevant that you may need to, real, to know, but these are the critical ones. So here's glucose. Glucose is the number one that we need to be well-versed in because this is the most important amongst all the sugars that exist out in nature. And as we've said, for the human body, critically important for our uh, existence, pretty much, right? We, all of our cells rely on glucose unless we're under extraordinary uh, circumstances. So D-glucose, again, also known as dextrose, right? Because it turns out to be dextrorotatory. We also call it commonly blood sugar. Again, when you're measuring sugar in your blood to test if you have diabetes or to monitor your blood sugar, if you are diabetic, what you're looking for is glucose. That's exactly what you are measuring. Most important energy producing monosaccharide in human biochemistry. Its metabolism releases enormous amounts of energy, highly exergonic, and that's what then helps fuel all sorts of endergonic processes that require energy to occur. And as we discuss, and we're going to come back to when we talk about metabolism, coupled reactions are those that one of them releases energy, the other one requires energy. Well, by putting them together, the releases energy then provides the fuel, i.e. the energy that the other one needs to go forward. So this is what one of the major roles of glucose. You take in starches and other carbohydrates from the diet, they get chopped down to primarily glucose, that glucose enters the circulation, and that glucose then serves to fuel all of those metabolic, uh, metabolic pathways and energy needs of the cell, it provides the energy as it gets metabolized to then drive a whole host of different processes that are life-sustaining, that require energy. Okay, we're gonna talk about all this, so just kind of anticipating what's coming. As I've said, glucose is also an essential building block for all kinds of different saccharides and then all kinds of other important biomolecules. So, as I mentioned already, we're gonna see more of this. It combines with galactose to give you lactose, which is milk sugar, if you will. It combines with fructose, right, to give you table sugar, i.e. sucrose. And then, as I mentioned, it combines with itself to form glycogen, this is in animals, and starches that come from plants, right, um, is pretty much pure glucose in polymeric form. This is digestible starch. And then we also have cellulose, which comes from the diet. This is what we call fiber. It's non-digestible. So many plant products contain dietary fiber, which is a polymer of glucose, uh, much like starch, but the attachment, the way in which the sugars are attached to each other is what makes it non-digestible as we're going to discuss. Okay, so here's, oh, let me go back for a second because I didn't stress these concepts in the, in the, in the structures that are, uh, are there, right? So again, 
if you realize what I was talking about earlier with the fingers, right? Left, uh, sorry, right, left, right, right. This is D-glucose. And what that translates to is down, up, down, right? The fact that this is up is what makes it D. Here, because this is up, meaning the same direction as this, that's what makes it beta. So let me clarify. Beta doesn't mean that the hydroxy is up. What it means is that it's the same direction as the CH2OH. I'll say that again. Beta does not mean the hydroxy is up. It means that it's in the same direction as the CH2OH because it turns out, if you've been following, we haven't even mentioned this at any point, but if you follow things, if you're paying attention, the L glucose, L glucose, would mandate that all of these, let me clean this up, in the L version of the glucose, this one, the, uh, this one, that one, and that one, the four chirality centers right here, they are in an opposite orientation. So L glucose has this pointing downward, this one pointing upward, <coughs> this one pointing downward, and that one pointing upward, okay? It's not shown here on the slide anywhere. I'm just giving you a heads up. We're going to see it a little bit later. For In order for it to be beta L glucose, this would be pointing down. This would have to be pointing down as well because it has to go in the same direction as the CH2OH. That's what defines beta. Uh, um, beta, yes, beta. All right, we'll come back to it. Let me um, point out the one on the bottom again. Down, up, down is glucose. This pointing upward is D-glucose. These two in the opposite orientation is what makes it the alpha version of the sugar. Here's galactose. We've already established it is different from glucose on carbon in number four, right? So C4 epimer of glucose. We've already talked about this. When you ingest any type of milk product, cheese, milk itself, cream, whatever it is, it comes with lactose, which is the primary sugar contained in all dairy products. Turns out lactose is a disaccharide, two sugars bonded together via an acetal linkage, as we're gonna see in more detail. When you ingest that compound, it gets hydrolyzed into glucose and galactose. So half of lactose is galactose, it turns out. Now, as we're going to learn, for galactose to be metabolized, galactose itself is useless to the body. The body must convert it to a glucose derivative. Otherwise, it cannot do anything with it. So we're going to talk in more detail a little bit later. There are genetic diseases associated with uh, a deficiency of the enzyme that's responsible for the conversion of galactose into glucose and its derivative, which is what ultimately gets converted to. If you don't have that enzyme or the enzyme is wrong or deficient or it's not working right, then the galactose starts to accumulate. If it's a genetic disorder, it starts from day one, meaning from the moment the embryo is formed, as the embryo develops. Now, of course, when the embryo is in the, in the body of the mom, the mom can provide, can take away that galactose and metabolize it and get rid of it if it's just an issue with the baby itself. So it's not an issue, it's not much of an issue. Once the baby is born, it's on its own, it's no longer connected to the mother's circulation, then that galactose can start to accumulate because the body cannot convert it into glucose. That condition is called galactosemia. Galactose on its own, because it starts to accumulate and the body can't do anything with it, is highly toxic. And one of the problems with galactosemia, it leads to all sorts of developmental disorders and all kinds of damage of all kinds of organs and tissues because it's suddenly this metabolite that starts to accumulate. Of course, it starts with lactation when the baby starts drinking milk. Um, it can actually be identified while the baby's still in utero. One of the tests for amniocentesis is testing for galactosemia. And then when the baby's born, we know that he, the baby cannot have milk. 
it's a difficult disease to manage. The baby cannot have any type of milk product for the, for the rest of their lives. They can't do that because it's going to cause problems. Okay. So again, structurally speaking, looking really, we have about another minute left. D galactose. That's what this means. Notice this means right, left, left, which is down, up, up, right? Up. This is galactose. If you, Pay close attention. This here is the alpha version because these are opposite. This is the beta version because these are in the same direction. All right, it's now 12.15. So this concludes today's lecture. We will then continue. I believe the next slide is on fructose. We'll continue with this discussion on carbohydrates uh, next Tuesday. Everybody have a great weekend. Please stay safe and we'll talk to you next week.